So which Warhammer 40k armies are having the hardest time of it in the current edition of the game? Let's talk about the top 10 weakest armies in the grim darkness of the far future. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where recently we did a video on some of the strongest armies in the game currently. This time I thought we'd do the counterpart and talk about some of the factions that Games Workshop might need to give a helping hand to, at least at some point. We'll talk through 10 of the factions that are struggling most in the game right now, a few of their strengths and weaknesses, and what sort of things they're typically putting on the table to do well with. As we've been talking about over the past couple of months, the whole Arcs of Omen season has brought some really quite big changes to Warhammer 40k, that despite basically turning the game on its head and changing a lot of core rules including detachments and things, 40k game balance is still looking rather good, at least compared with historically. And now more so than just about at any point in 40k's history, most of the weaker armies do have a bit more of a chance to compete with the strong stuff. Due to the pretty massive game-wide changes, I thought that this was worth redoing it since the Nephilim video. There maybe hasn't been quite as much movement on this list compared with the strongest armies in the game, but still only 5 of the weakest armies from the last video are still present on this list in one space or another. Games Workshop really has shaken up the meta good and proper. As I said though, in terms of win rates and things, the armies that are doing worse at the moment generally are doing kind of better than they were previously. Bar just a couple of slightly more niche armies, almost everything is around about a Games Workshop's win rate target of 45%, and that's a far cry from what it was before. As always, in terms of stats for weighing up strong and weak armies in the game, there's a few ways that you can look at things. I'll go through in terms of tournament win percentage in this one. It's certainly not the only metric that you can use to establish an army's power in game, but I think it is a useful one. We'll also talk about the number of grand tournaments they've won in Arcs of Omen so far, showing how well the factions might compete at the highest level, and also roughly how regularly played they are in the current game of 40k. Typically the armies that people think are stronger get played a bit more regularly than ones that aren't, and that can be another useful data point. Before we get into the top 10, there are a fair few factions in the midfield that maybe aren't so far behind this list, but perhaps aren't so far behind the top 10 either. In terms of tournament win rates, armies like Grey Knights, Salamanders, Imperial Knights, Leagues of Votan and Necrons all seem to be hovering around about 47 or 48%. Arguably these are some of the more balanced armies in 40k right now, neither ahead of the pack nor too far behind. It's good to see Necrons and Grey Knights in this tier I think. I was wondering with the hits to their rules like Armour of Contempt and their objective changes whether they might be in the lower section here, but it seems that they're holding their own at least for now. Games Workshop did give them both some fairly nice points cuts, I guess. Moving into the 10 weakest armies proper though, and first up in 10th place we have the Tyranids. The bugs still really aren't doing quite as badly as you might have expected given the cataclysmic nerfs they've suffered one after another since their codex dropped, despite basically having two brutal balance passes where almost every single unit in their codex went up in points, plus having some major rules nerfs, they're still holding their own with a win percent of 46%, and have even managed to still win a grand tournament in Arcs of Omen. They're still fairly popular as well, 12th most played army in Arcs of Omen, maybe middle of the pack there. It perhaps does just go to show just how crazily strong the Tyranid Codex was on release, that it's had basically three successive waves of enormous nerfs so far, and they're still basically doing kind of fine, slightly on the lower side of 40k power spectrum, but not by much. In terms of their army strength, I'd still say that their psychic phase is one of the best things about them, good mortal wound output when they're needed, plus useful powers like Catalyst and Onslaught. I feel like their high fleets are actually kind of balanced at the moment, lots of people are using various different ones with different tactics, and their synaptic imperatives gives you some rather nice army-wide buffs, particularly things like inbore saves from a single unit of zone thropes and various other damage ones. The nerfs have bitten pretty hard though, it's sad to see at least a few of the units basically going from being good choices to basically unplayable, biovores and harpies without the spore mine seeding plus the flyer changes and are basically never seen in competitive army lists. I can't help but think that maybe just some points cost changes might be more appropriate for them. Otherwise, I feel that rather than just coasting on raw datasheet strength, a lot of the army just needs to rely on tricks and synergies to be effective now. Piling combos of things like psychic powers and stratagems and synaptic imperatives on one unit to try and make the most out of it each turn. Tyranid army lists do seem to be fairly diverse units-wise. Things like walking hive tyrants are more common now, as are carnifexes and screamer killers. Tyranifexes, neurothropes and a single unit of zonethropes are also popular picks. I was kind of wondering whether people might be shifting towards more hordy type builds, but perhaps not quite so much at the top levels of Tyranid play at the moment. I've still not been seeing very many lists use things like Gorgon on Gaunts or Termagants for example. 
Overall, it does look like the Tyranids have been brought back into line rather brutally. They have been in a rather good spot ever since their codex came out, and now they're looking kind of lower middle tier. In ninth place on the list, we have the Death Guard. Their army win percentage is 46%, again, not dreadful. They've won one grand tournament, and they've played just a little bit less than the Tyranids, 14th most played in Arcs of Omen. The Death Guard are a relatively popular faction due to being one of the title factions of 8th edition. In terms of army strengths, Death Guard definitely have some rather obvious ones and weaknesses. For the most part, they're pretty tough to remove from the board, high toughness characteristics, reasonable saves, and of course minus one damage from disgustingly resilient. Some armies really will struggle to deal proper damage to them, and they do have some rather nice supporting rules in the codex as well, contagions of Nurgle to make enemies easier to kill, particularly in combat. Flash Outbreak to potentially throw a Blighted Warlord trait all over the enemy with a fast-moving bloat drone or something. And for Plague Companies, Mortarians, Anvil and the Inexorable both seem to be pretty popular still. It's quite nice that Games Workshop didn't hurt their secondary as well. Spread the Sickness remains very good, sometimes with a few units of Pox Walkers to do that. As for downsides, they do remain pretty slow. They're generally going to be on the receiving end of punishment as they move up the board and do need to rely on that tankiness before they get to grips with the enemy. A bunch of their units are a lot more combat focused compared with range as well, besides some demon engines. Arcs of Omen was a bit of a weird change for them as well. Lots of models arguably fell in durability due to the loss of Armour of Contempt, which in particular made their Terminators very tough. Some of the units got some decent points cuts to compensate, some of them didn't. In general, for current trends for Death Guard lists, a lot of lists still seem to be using plenty of Plague Marines, they're not going absolutely crazy with them. There's still plenty of staples like Terminators and Spawn being run to support them, maybe a few units of Pox Walkers, various good HQs and good support characters like the Tallyman and the Foul Blight Spawn. Without Armour of Contempt and a few Demon Engine points cuts, it does seem that Demon Engines are a bit more popular, more Mephitic Blight Haulers and Bloat Drones compared with before, and still plenty of Plague Burst Crawlers, which are just generally efficient. Overall, still kind of lower middle tier as a Warhammer 40k army, though definitely not out of the running for competing with plenty of armies. Moving on, in 8th place we've got the Drukhari. They're also on a win percentage of 46%, and have similarly only won the one grand tournament in Arcs of Omen. The Drukhari still seem to be very, very niche as well. They are one of the least played factions in the game, as 21st most played army in Arcs of Omen. I feel like when their codex came out in early 9th edition, they had an initial rush of popularity there, and it's kind of dwindled since then, with a lot of their most exciting rules getting toned down, and a general climb down in terms of power for the army, both in terms of nerfs and other similarly powerful codexes being released. In terms of the greatest strengths of the army, I'd certainly say speed is one of them. They're very, very fast for just about every unit in the codex, and they can get some very long charges with power from pain. And for the most part, a wood raiders, just about every unit in the codex, are somewhat usable. He can go down pretty heavily into Cabal, Coven, or Cult lists, and have plenty of decent units to choose from. Certainly Incubi and Drazar do tend to feature in quite a lot of popular lists, and the vast majority of armies do revolve around jumping out of transports like Raiders and Venoms, perhaps the most iconic playstyle. With all the speed and hard-hitting power, they do generally tend to be at least fairly fragile for the cost, barring a few Coven units. And since the repeated applied nerfs, the Drukhari do seem to be just generally a bit middle of the road for most of their data sheets. Fairly well balanced in that you get what you pay for, maybe just not enormously stand out in the power spectrum of Warhammer 40k in general. In terms of recent developments in top army lists, the points changes for witches and racks do genuinely seem to have skewed things a little bit more with more witches and fewer racks, as you'd expect. Armour of Contempt going away might have helped the witches a bit as well. Mass AP-1 attacks as primary damage dealing is a bit more viable now. The army construction rules from Arcs of Omen are maybe a little bit annoying as well. It does seem that perhaps the majority of people are choosing to build around a real space raid in the Arcs of Omen detachment now, now that their patrol system doesn't work quite as well. The alternative to that is taking an allied section, and perhaps the biggest draw to that is running Drazar as your warlord, as he is rather good with the full rerolls to hit and wound traits. Overall though, despite a whole load of rules changes in codex creep, the Drukhari still seem to be holding it together. I feel like having lots of very fast and pretty dangerous units is generally going to be a good thing for an army in 40k. In the hands of a skilled player using terrain well, you're not going to be able to kill that much of them, and you're often going to have a challenging game. Moving on, in 7th place we have the Blood Angels. They have had a bit of an about turn in Arcs of Omen, going from being arguably the strongest Space Marine chapter in Nephilim, to perhaps one of the weaker ones, at least out of Divergent Space Marine chapters in Arcs. 
Their win percentage hasn't really changed too much. They're still on 45% at tournaments, though they have taken three grand tournament wins so far, more than any others on this top 10 weakest list. Admittedly though, all of those three tournament wins are all due to one skilled player and Mr. Sam Procopio, so it could be a bit more of a testament to one expert player's skill as opposed to the strength of the faction overall. It does go to show that they can compete at the highest level though. Otherwise, they're a kind of middling army in popularity at the moment, perhaps less so than sometimes in their history, 15th most played in Arcs of Omen. And in terms of their actual gameplay, they do remain just a little bit monodimensional, jump pack units, mainly sanguinary guard, bounding towards the enemy, supported by some very nice support characters like Priest, Ancients, and maybe Dante himself. A sanguinary guard can certainly mess up just about anything in melee between the plus one to wound and their unique combat doctrine, and there's plenty of other decent support units to round out a list, a few troops choices usually, maybe a single squad of death company to fall on fury their way up the board, and perhaps a bit of fire support like some outflanking eradicators, or another source of melter fire. As for downsides, since their 9th edition codex came out, they're maybe just a little bit monodimensional, maybe not quite as much depth as some of the other codexes for the space marines, I just feel there's a little bit less in terms of exciting stuff out of the stratagems and war gear sections compared with some, though some are very useful when they support the sanguinary guard. Perhaps due to their reliance on things like the jump pack units, they're also unusually vulnerable to things like damage 2 weapons, minus 1 damage things that hurt their Onkarmen swords and things, and compared with other combat chapters like say Space Wolves, they don't have much to hand out fights last, so they are a bit susceptible to that. Between these it means that they can have a bad match up to Death Guard for example. I feel like in terms of what's kept them down despite Space Wind in general doing way better is probably Armour of Contempt. Both the Sanguinary Guard and the Death Company got loads out of this. They're both elite infantry units that could get light cover fairly easily, plus didn't have any invul save whatsoever, so it was a really big meaningful loss. They did get some free or cheaper war gear, but I don't think it's really made up for it. Otherwise, a bunch of the other Space Marine buffs maybe had somewhat marginal impacts for them, I think. Things like Devastator Doctrine maybe not so meaningful if you're going towards Assault. I feel like a fair few of the units that got decent points buffs tended to be more shooting units than combat ones. Overall, I feel like a fair few Blood Angels lists are at least fairly similar to how they were before. Lots of Sanguinary Guard, plus a unit of Death Company perhaps, though maybe with a different sort of flavour of supporting elements. Overall, good to see that they're not completely out of the running, but it seems like Arcs of Omen hasn't massively helped them. Moving on, and also on 45% wins, we have the Adeptus Auroritus. The Sisters of Battle have taken a rather big tumble since their Nephilim days. In 40k's last season, they were pretty firmly on the top 10 list rather than the bottom 10. The Sisters have won one grand tournament in Arcs of Omen so far, but remain a very, very rarely played faction right now. A similar kind of level to Drukhari, they were doing a lot better before, and I sort of feel like people just aren't quite as excited to put them on the table in their current rule set. In terms of current strength of the army, maybe some of the core units that are taken haven't changed enormously. Zephyrin, Retributors and Repentia are all excellent elite damage dealers, though after Armour of Contempt has gone away, they've definitely been skewed a lot more to be Glass Cannon kind of units, can it punch pretty hard but will get removed a lot more easily in return. Still the vast majority of lists tend to build around Bloody Rose for the very nice extra attack and extra AP, plus Sacred Rites typically for the exploding sixes in combat unless something else makes more sense in the given matchup. Miracle Dice are also an enormously important mechanic for them, being able to punch in big sixes to guarantee long charges if you need to, or potentially getting enormous amounts of damage out of a stray melter hit. Overall it does just seem in general that the sisters are going to be a harder army to play at the moment. Their elite infantry is a bit more costly than before and not that hard to remove from the table. On top of that, a couple of their secondary objectives were toned down a bit, even if they kept their good defend the shrine one. And in terms of army list play, I think a few less people are taking paragon war suits, now they're not quite as durable, and Celestian Sacrosants are a bit more popular as a unit that can tank things on the battle line better than most. Overall, it's a bit of a come down from Nephilim, I think. They have gone from being one of the scariest armies to play in the game to one of the slightly weaker ones. Moving onwards and unfortunately downwards, in 5th place we have the Thousand Sons. Following the points and rules changes in Arcs of Omen, I'm not really too surprised that these guys have been struggling somewhat. They did seem to be one of the harder hit armies by the changes, and kind of came from a middling sort of spot before. Their win rate currently is 44%, with 0 grand tournament wins so far in Arcs of Omen, and they're quite infrequently played as well, 20th most popular in Arcs of Omen at time of recording. Kind of like the Death Guard, they are an army with some big strengths and weaknesses, I've got really quite a nice powerful psychic phase with teleport tricks from the Cult of Duplicity and Dark Matter Crystal. 
mortal wounds en masse with a bunch of smites and layer damage and defensive buffs that you can put on units like Scarab Occult Terminators. Between the Scarabs and the Rubrics, the Thousand Sons generally have a whole load of units that are obsec to park on the objectives and make sure they score at least fairly high on the primary. As for downsides, besides certain movement tricks like their version of walk time and teleporting, they tend to be very slow when they're on the board, and the vast majority of the codex that aren't Rubric Marines, Sorcerers, Scarab Occult Terminators, and maybe Spawn just tend to be a bit underwhelming. They also might not be their biggest fans to see anything with a huge amount of psychic denial tricks on the board as well. Armies like Grey Knights with their protection against mortal wounds and good psychic defence might not be the best to see on the other side of the table. In terms of recent changes to their list, I'd say that their main problem was that when they lost their Armour of Contempt, they didn't really get any hugely meaningful buffs to the core of their army, things like the Scarab Occult Terminators or the Rubric Marines. A lot of their points buff fell on units that just weren't being taken quite as regularly, Plus, compared with previously, I feel like a lot of their lists were being slightly carried by Demon Flamers en masse when their data sheet was just massively undercosted, and now they've just got a fairly more sane power level. That's a crotch that they can't lean on. I'd say perhaps out of the latest points changes, Born becoming a bit cheaper than before is one of the best things that came out of it. 21 points per model is quite nice, and they are pretty effective. Certainly one big unit to get that 4 plus invul save power on, then there are a whole load of annoying wounds to deal with. Moving on, in 4th place we have the Chaos Space Marines, again these guys really are a mighty army that's fallen on hard times. In Nephilim we typically had Emperor's Children and Creations of Bile ruling the roost and winning really quite a lot of tournaments. The overall faction win rate was plus 50%, now it's dropped down to 44%, but they are still winning a few grand tournaments. I'd say that perhaps the number of big events won though does kind of correlate with them being just a very very widely played faction, at least a few people are making them work with the amount of people playing. They are the 5th most played army in Arcs of Omen, though even this is down significantly for basically being the most popular faction in Nephilim, unless you lump literally every Space Marine subcodex in altogether. For strengths of the army, I'd certainly say their HQ section is probably the best thing about the army. They can make some hideously dangerous melee characters between Lord Discordant and perhaps the Demon Prince with Golax, which actually got better due to ignoring damage modifiers now. Plus they've got great buffing characters like the Master of Possessions for healing and reviving models, plus making units tougher, plus the Dark Apostle for illusory supplication. Beyond that, they've just got some very strong melee units and a good choice of legions with which to put them into battle with, a few of which push you in some slightly different ways with units. In terms of downsides, I'd still say that their secondary objectives perhaps aren't exactly standouts, and are a bit of a relative weakness, certainly for some legions that don't have a particularly good specific one. Their ranged options are also not the best as well, and lots of their shooting units just seem flat over costed. In terms of army list changes, a few more people are picking up Hellbrutes and Legionaries, given that their war gear got free. Plus with the points increase to Terminators, more people are choosing to take Possessed and Chosen compared with those, maybe being as a big focal unit for buffs with a Master of Possession or Illusory Supplication, plus that very nice Black Rune of Damnation. Legion choices do appear to have changed around a bit as well, while all the top lists seem to be winning with Emperor's Children and Black Legion, it does seem that armies like Wordbearers are competing a bit better with those now. For Black Legion, Abaddon going up in points cost certainly didn't help, and for Emperor's Children, the Mark of Slaanesh getting 5 points more expensive is actually a pretty reasonable tone down in their power. Creations of Bile got hit particularly hard as well, basically having their fights and death mechanic cut in half. I feel like we might see a few more lists playing Wordbearers at least, which just offer a fair bit of raw melee power with re-roll hits, and some nice synergies with Possess. In third place on the list, we still have the Engine Seers of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Unfortunately, despite a rather generous amount of buffs from Games Workshop, they still seem to be on the lower tier of things, though admittedly their tournament performance has improved really quite a lot since the last season. They were around about a 37 or 38 win percentage in Nephilim, and one of the worst factions in the game. Now they're up at more like 44. I would say that this is actually probably a credit to Games Workshop that we're getting down to the third worst army in Warhammer 40k. At least in terms of major factions, a 44 win percentage really isn't that bad at all in 40k's history. I feel like in terms of winning games with weaker factions, now is about as good a time as 40k's ever had. Still though, it's not exactly excellent news for them. They've only won one grand tournament in Arcs of Omen so far, but at least it's something. And are maybe just a little bit more played than they were previously, going up to 19th most played army in Arcs of Omen a little bit more than they were as people come back to experiment with some changes. As before, a lot of the army strength tends to come from stacking overlapping synergies. You can put an awful lot of rules on just one unit in the battle line here. They'll have their Forge World traits, Doctrina Imperatives and maybe Canticles, 
plus various character buffs like focal targeted ones from holy orders, reroll auras, and maybe even some stratagems as well. It means that you can make some core units just exceptionally tough or dangerous, often big blocks of Skitari Rangers or Vanguard typically. In terms of strong data sheets, it does seem that what was good last time still seems to be taken in abundance at the moment. Skitari troops, particularly Vanguard with the 4 plus to auto wound stratagem, Rust Stalkers still seem to be the king of infantry melee, Iron Striders are great for a whole bunch of shooting and that eradication of flesh secondary, and some Cerberus and Infiltrators units to hold down the midfield and hold back the enemy. Back that all up with some Tech Priests and Skitari Marshals with Skitari Warlord traits and you're in for a good time. Board world wise, Mars and Lucius still seem to be the most popular by far, though Riser has perhaps seen a little bit of an uptick in terms of play, with a bunch of melee units getting a bit better, like Dragoons. In terms of weaknesses though, at least while they have their current codex, they are going to remain a fairly complex army to play. It does underwhelm a bit if you can't get multiple buffs running at the same time. Some of their units can just be a little bit clunky and hard to bring to bear, and they're still not really enjoying the initial limitation in command points early in the game. I'm sure some ad mech lists would like to spend a bit more in terms of relics and warlord traits being bought in, which they used to have in excess in the past. In Arcs of Omen, Games Workshop did give them a whole load of interesting buffs. All their previous rules nerfs and when they were stomping the meta are now reverse. They've had many points cuts, Catatrons became core, and they got some better secondaries. It did come at the expense of the loss of the Skitari veteran cohort as well, though I guess they handed out the better invul saves to most of the codex. Overall, despite rather a lot of changes though, I'd say that many army lists haven't perhaps hugely changed from all this. It does still seem to be core Skitari choices that are getting the majority of play. Maybe a few more selections for things like Dune Riders to transport the Rust Stalkers to battle. A few more Catatron Servitors, though I've not seen many lists that go particularly heavy on them. And Corpuscari Electro Priest Deep Striking seem to be a little bit more tempting as well. Overall, it is good to see them doing significantly better than they were before, but still look like they're remaining a challenging army to play well. In second place on the list, I thought we'd do a bit of a catch-all for the slightly weaker Codex Space Marine chapters. Codex Space Marines always being a bit of an awkward one to rank, depending on whether you count the individual chapter books as individual codexes, or whether you lump them all together. The ones that would arguably be down below Abmech in terms of win percentage would be the Ultramarines on 43, White Scars on 38, Raven Guard on 38, and Imperial Fists on 27. And if you were going to break down the codexes individually, you could certainly still argue that Imperial Fists look on paper to be one of the weakest armies in the game. For the other codex chapters that aren't quite as divergent, like things like Black Templars or Space Wolves, the only two that are doing better than this are Salamanders, up on a 48%, and the Iron Hands, which are stomping the meta alongside the Dark Angels at the moment, up on a big 56%. Overall, if you did take the average and lump all of these Codex Asatius chapters together, they would still be featuring on this list at 46% currently. I feel like there really is a disconnect between some of these weaker ones and armies like Iron Hands, which have a lot more going for them, and play rather differently with their all-game Devastator Doctrine and big rerolls. Certainly the four that aren't doing well haven't been doing great in tournaments. So far, no big wins for Ultramarines, White Scars, Raven Guard, or Imperial Fists. I would still say that each of these chapters do have interesting reasons to play them. The Ultramarines have Gilliman, redeploying infiltration units like Invicta Tactical Warsuits and Phobos, and that Seal of Oath Relic for some massive damage. White Scars get advanced and charge, and enormously hard-hitting charges when they get to their Assault Doctrine. Raven Guard have multiple Alpha Strike tricks, like forward deployment and pre-game moves, and Imperial Fists will quite like the Devastator Doctrine change, which will help them out against heavy vehicles and things, plus all-around Bolters being better and ignores cover, plus the Eye of Hypnoth are all nice things for shooting. It does still seem, though, that if you really want to play a Devastator Doctrine shooting Space Marine army, Iron Hands just outcompete them massively. I do feel that maybe it's a little bit unfair comparing these with other Space Marine sub-factions, if, say, the Iron Hands and Salamanders codexes didn't exist, you'd probably see a few more people playing these other factions as the next best option. I feel like that would mean that people would do a bit better with them, particularly all the people with successor chapters that don't mind hopping around rules a bit. I think you could maybe argue that the win rates of these are probably a bit on the understated side, both for that reason, plus also particularly Ultramarines often having a lot of newer players in their makeup compared with some armies. In general, for Space Marines, they did get a decent power boost from Arcs of Omen. Armor of Contempt was generally swapped for cheaper points, which helped a whole bunch of units, but did maybe hurt a few of them. They got a nice boost from their troops on objectives rule, and being able to change around their combat doctrines did help quite a bit. In terms of generically strong datasheets that are usually expected to be appearing in lots of Space Marine lists, 
Things like Infiltrators, Thunderhammer Terminators, Devastators and Aggressors I think are all a lot nicer than they were before. Still though, at the moment I'd probably argue that the Space Marine Codexes are just kind of badly balanced. Iron Hands really just do what Ultramarines and Imperial Fists want to do, but better. And White Scars and Raven Guard just don't seem to be able to compete with armies like Space Wolves, Black Templars and Blood Angels for delivering melee units to the fray. Finally, it seems that we're sticking with Space Marines for the last entry on this list, and arguably the weakest major faction in current Warhammer 40k is the Death Watch, a very low win percentage of 35%, and apparently the least played major faction of any in 40k currently. I would bear in mind though that with having so few results for them, it wouldn't take all that much to change their percentage by quite a bit, but I can see some pretty good reasons for why people aren't choosing to put Death Watch on the tabletop at the moment. For army strengths and reasons to play them, the Death Watch do do some things pretty differently. They've got some nice and flexible mixed unit obsec kill teams where you can get objectives secured on some unusual units. Bikes and jump infantry in particular are interesting. And they can also be good targets for big focus buffs, putting interesting combinations of damage dealers together. They're also not a bad chapter if you want to build a Dreadnought Castle with things like that Dominus Aegis for a 5 plus inball save or relics like that Vorkar Pattern or Spasator for better damage against flying targets. Otherwise, they do have some nice psychic powers, including a 5 plus feel no pain one, plus some teleport tricks like the Beacon Angelus. For downsides though, while they do have a few nice support rules, I do kind of feel that they maybe lack a bit of raw power and damage that some of the other chapters can bring, and I'm not hugely convinced that mixing up a whole bunch of Primaris and Obsec kill teams is actually all that effective at the moment, and enough to make people really want to play the faction as a whole. It's definitely fun, but maybe just doesn't add as much as it might have done earlier in the edition. Otherwise, depending on the unit, they can also be pretty slow when they're on the board, and one of their core mechanics in the special issue ammo just feels super redundant at the moment. Beyond that, I feel like a bunch of the Space Marine changes that came about in Arcs of Omen really didn't help them all that much. The Combat Doctrine change doesn't actually apply to Death Watch in any way, which is kind of annoying for them. They lost their Kill Team Strike Force formation, which was rather a good one, and that could be a way that they could have added in a bunch more damage. And perhaps even their core Firstborn Proteus team seems a little bit lacklustre compared with Devastators or Stern Guard veterans just for more damage on cheaper bodies. With such low player numbers, I guess it wouldn't really take too much to turn them around, a few people really figuring them out and harnessing the best things that the Codex has to offer. But currently it looks like Death Watch are one of the armies that are struggling most in current 40k. So anyway, I think we'll leave that there in terms of some of the weaker armies in Warhammer 40k currently. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. I'd be interested to hear your guys' takes on these, whether you've been doing well or badly with the current factions on the list. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics. I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming just about each day. And if you'd like to see the counterpart video to this one for the 10 strongest factions in the game, I'll leave it linked down in the video description. Otherwise, if you'd like to help keep these videos coming, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description as well. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description below. In any case, an enormous thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.